I'm crafting one of my most impressive knives yet, but there's a problem. To bring this artistic vision to life, I must conquer the following. A carbon fiber handle with 24 karat gold inlays. That is not a pretty shirt. A black diamond pommel nut serving as a glass breaker. A complex alternating twist Damascus forged blade. A handle that looks like it was dipped in glass. I sanded through the finish right here and right here. So I'm gonna start back all over again. My name is Kyle Royer and I'm a master bladesmith. First thing I want to do on this fighter is forge the Damascus for the blade. I begin with 1084 and 15 in 20 strips of steel. I weld around the seam of every strip of steel, sealing the pieces up so no atmosphere can get inside the billet. After letting the billet soak for a few minutes, I forge weld the billet together with my 40 ton hydraulic press. The 15 in 20 was a slightly different width than the 1084 steel, so by grinding the edges down I can get everything flush. If I left the 1084 wider, it would fold over around the 15 and 20 layers, leaving cold shuts all down the edges of my billet. One of my all time favorite things in knife making is forging out the Damascus billets. I love seeing the scale form on the edge of the billet and slowly peel off the edges as I forge out the billet. I also love the colors of the billet. When you first take it out of the forge, it's so bright and yellow. And as it cools down, it turns into this creamy, smooth, dull red color. After getting the billet drawn out to length, I can let it cool, grind the scale off, cut the billet in half, and tack it back together with the welder. Then it's ready to go back in the forge for another forging session. What this is gonna do is basically double the number of layers in the billet since we cut it into two pieces. I don't know what it is about that barbecue sauce, but that Sweet Baby's Ray barbecue sauce almost always gives me heartburn. And I hardly ever get heartburn from anything. I'm not joking. Why are you laughing? I have a lot of doubts and concerns in my mind right now about how this Damascus pattern is going to come out. I've never done this pattern before, and I don't know how it's going to look on the finished knife. The pattern could look good once I get the billet done, but by the time the blade is ground and heat treated and finished, Will it still look good? Will this Damascus be a good pattern to even start out with? Am I gonna have days and days into this pattern and then have to start over because it didn't come out? I've got our two pieces forge welded together and draw them out. This time, we're not gonna be multiplying the layers. What we're gonna do is draw it out into a small square bar and prepare it for twisting. I get my brother and my dad to help hold the torches on both sides of the billet so it'll heat up quickly and evenly. And then I can twist up a small section, move on to the next and continue all the way down the bar. Something else you may notice is I'm twisting each spot a different direction. I'll twist one right hand and then I'll twist the next left hand. And then in the end, when we have all four bars stacked on top of each other, it should give a little bit of a chevron effect where the two different direction twists meet each other. After twisting up all the Damascus, I forge the bars back into a square shape. It's taken me over two weeks to get to this point with the Damascus. I've spent a lot of time working on the practice pieces, getting the right size and the proper number of twists, the proper distance apart from each other, and then actually working on this billet too. With all the practice pieces I did and then this actual billet, there's quite a bit of time already invested into this fighter. Spent a good amount of time laying out our four bars. I think this is how I want the pattern to look. The two bars in the center of the billet, they mirror each other and then the two on the outside are staggered offset to the center, but they mirror each other on the outside. So I think it's gonna look really cool. Here's our billet all ready to go. We've got all four interrupted twist bars on here. I've got them all sealed up with MIG welds so we can heat it up to forge welding temperature. Everything's nice and clean and fits pretty tight. So it should go well, hopefully. Got a lot of work in this piece so far. I lightly forge weld all four of our twisted bars together. I don't have a lot of extra material to reduce everything down, so I very delicately press everything and hope that I get good, clean forge welds. After getting the billet forge welded together and drawn out slightly, I grind all the MIG welds off the side of the billet and then begin forging in the tip shape of the blade. I want the pattern to follow the cutting edge of the blade all the way out through the tip. That's why I'm forging the tip up into such a weird shape right now. 
I mark out places for the ricasso and tang and then begin drawing them out. Drawing out the tang can be pretty stressful on the Damascus pattern sometimes, but it looks like everything's staying together very well. If the four twisted bars didn't forge well together very well, I would probably start to see that as I draw out the tang. The tang's being put through so much stress as it's drawn out that if the forge welds weren't done well, things would start to come apart. Once the blade's drawn out and cooled, I surface grind the sides on my 1958 Benton Harbor, Michigan Coville surface grinder. Whoa, there's our Damascus. That looks really cool. I love how it follows the edge right here. That's gonna look awesome. Got the blade rough ground and have a 120 grit finish on the bevels just to reduce the chance of the blade cracking when we harden it. I'm gonna pop it in the electrically controlled heat treating kiln oven at uh, 1550 degrees, we're gonna let it heat up, soak a little bit, and then quench in some nice warm Parks 50 to hopefully harden this thing up super hard. The blade's been soaking for 10 minutes. The oil's 110 degrees. It's time to harden our blade. Pop it out, up and down a lot. Nothing dramatic. Turn the oven off and wipe it down with a towel thing. Not towel, can't think. T-shirt, yeah, that's what they're called. Blade looks pretty nice. I don't think it warped at all. Go ahead and check and see if it's hard now with a chainsaw file. It's good and hard. I'm gonna let the heat treating oven cool down and then temper this thing at maybe 410 or 15 degrees for a couple hours. Once a couple hours have passed, the blade is done tempering and I can continue grinding the blade bevels. Grinding this blade, I have one major fear. The blade grind I've chosen for this knife is one of the most complex I've ever done. And I'm very concerned that I may mess it up and have to start completely over on my Damascus. I take my time trying to be as careful as possible. One small slip up could ruin the blade or at least cause me to have to grind it down thinner. For you, it's only been a few minutes. For me, I've invested many days into this knife now. And if I have to restart because the blade grind was too complex for me to handle, it would be devastating. After spending many hours at the grinder, the blade came out very nice. I didn't destroy it. I've taken the blade as far as it'll go for now. Next, I'm gonna focus on the guard. I put the blade in a carbide file guide and use it to guide where I'm gonna mill a little bit off the sides of the tang. This will leave a tiny shoulder on the tang so I can get a beautifully tight guard fit. Got the tang cleaned up nicely. It's got a 220 grit finish on the sides and have the top and bottom cleaned up as well. The next thing we need to do is fit our guard. I think we've got a piece of metal that's plenty big, so we should be able to work with this no problem. We're gonna be making a pretty thick guard at about a half inch thick. I don't have any half inch thick metal, so we're just gonna use this one inch thick metal and cut it one half inch long. And then I'll start grinding and milling and processing this down into a piece we can make our guard out of. It can be really handy if you keep stock oversized larger than you think you need. As long as you have tools to process that stock down, it gives you the flexibility to make whatever you want. In this case, I've got a giant chunk of mild steel and I can cut it up with the bandsaw and process it down with the grinders in the mill to get a nice piece the exact size I needed. The bulk of the material's already been removed with the mill, but I still need to go in and gently remove a tiny amount of material all around the corners in order to get the ricasso to fit into the guard. I put a bunch of layers of duct tape around the blade and that'll allow me to clamp it very, very tightly in the vise. Then I can put the guard on and use a special punch that goes around the tang and drive the guard on with a hammer. We're gonna drive it on and then we'll remove some material with a file and keep driving it on over and over again until the ricasso leaves a mark around on the guard. I call this rotary tool I'm using the high speed dental burr. And I'm using the tiniest of carbide burrs to remove a small amount of material to make the guard fit perfectly. To do this work with the dental burr, I'm looking through my engraving microscope so I can see exactly what I'm doing more clearly. I 
I messed with fitting the guard for quite a while and finally got it to a place I'm happy with. You still have to lightly tap it in place. You can't quite push it on by hand. And in order to take it off, you have to lightly, lightly tap on the end of the tang. Only like once though. And then it pops off. I believe it's gonna be about perfect though. By the time we finish the blade and do the etching on the blade and the, the tang will get etched and stuff, I think the material will all be a little bit smaller and this should fit on by hand. The reason I need the guard to fit on by hand is because this is gonna be the kind of takedown where the customer is actually encouraged to take the entire knife apart and put it back together. We're gonna to make a cool takedown tool and everything for it because you probably don't wanna have your customer get this nice knife and then make them go buy an anvil and a hammer and have to bang on the knife to get the guard off. Now that the guard is fit, the next thing to work on is the handle. We're gonna make a frame that goes around the tang on the top and bottom of the handle. So what you'll see looking at the bottom view of the handle or the top view of the handle, this quasi isotropic piece sandwiched by a piece of this on each side of it. First thing I need to do is decide how thick the two scales I cut off of this block are, mark them out and then go bandsaw them off. I'm cutting out this block of carbon fiber on what I call the world's loudest bandsaw. Dad put this thing together and I don't know where this bandsaw came from, but I don't think I've ever heard a piece of equipment this small that makes this much noise. I love it though. It works really well for cutting out blocks of material and quickly cutting off little pieces of metal and stuff. It's a great tool. It's just extremely loud. Next, I work on flattening out all the pieces on the 2x72 Broadback grinder. The pieces have some high and low spots from the bandsaw blade and the grinder makes quick work of getting everything pretty flat. After finishing up on the 2x72, I move over to the disc sander. This will allow me to get the pieces even more flat. I want all the pieces to fit together so tightly that there's no gaps or daylight anywhere between the pieces when they fit together. I got our two frame pieces all cut out and shaped. I also lined up the top and bottom frame piece on one of the scales and drilled some holes through it. That way we can stick some little tiny lineup pins through there and locate these as we're epoxying them together. To hold all these handle pieces together, I'm using some very good quality West System G-Flex epoxy. I left the finish at 120 grit on all the pieces just to give the epoxy a little bit more to bind to. The finer the finish is, the less peaks and valleys there are for the epoxy to go down into and really bind to the parts. I'll let the epoxy set up overnight and then I shape the ends of the handle. Something that I had to work on was I needed to thin my tang just a little bit so the tang would actually fit in the slot. Well, as it turns out, in a heartbeat, I accidentally took too much off and made it so my blade could wobble in the handle a little bit. I'm just not happy with how this is coming out. I wanna get, I wanna get it really nice looking in there since the customer is gonna be able to take the handle apart and see the inside of the handle, just not feeling the way this is looking so far. So I thought we'd try to pry the handle apart and see how well the epoxy is holding. Mm. Wow, I had to pry on that really hard. Wow, the epoxy held really, really well. It actually peeled layers of the carbon fiber off a little bit. I'm gonna clean up all these pieces and see how everything looks and we'll think about putting these pieces back together without remaking the frame. I finally have it where I want. I think we're ready to epoxy these. So I'm gonna mix up some more West System and get that bad boy put back on there and let it dry overnight. I took all the clamps off. Let's see if the handle fits onto the blade nicely this time, hopefully. Okay, so far so good, so far so good. Oh, it fits all the way to where it goes. I am so excited that I get to finally move forward on this now. Now that the handle fits the way I want it to, I need to thread the end of the tang. The tang needs to be threaded so the pommel nut that we'll make later will thread onto the end of it and pull the entire handle assembly tightly against the blade, holding everything in place firmly.
Got the end of the tang shaped for threading, but right now it's really hard. So I want to O'Neill it so it'll be nice and soft so we'll be able to cut threads in it easier. So I'm just gonna lightly heat the end up until it's glowing a little bit, and then we'll let it air cool. After kernel O'Neilling the tang, I let it cool down and cleaned off all the oxides with the Scotch-Brite. I'm gonna use a little Burr Life and a 1032 die to thread it. I forget how amazing it is when you have a brand new die. <laughs> it's not like dull and worn out with the teeth broken off. It actually cuts instead of smears. They're only like 10 bucks a piece. You should just throw them away more often. I find it's very easy for myself to get stuck in that mode where you wanna use something until it just absolutely has no life left in it at all. But in reality, I need to remember to throw things out before they reach that stage, and I'll probably save a lot of time and money just switching over to something fresh, be it a die or a sanding belt or a tap or whatever. Beautiful. I just got a special delivery. Right here, we've got a three-quarter carat black diamond. This is gonna go in the end of the pommel nut and act as kind of a glass breaker because it's got a really nice sharp point on it. It's gonna be really cool for this knife. I need to practice setting that diamond, so I bought some cubic zirconia. This should be super fun to work with this diamond. I've never set any stones in any of my knives before, so this is gonna be a world's first for me. This is why we do practice, because I actually messed up already. I was trying to see if the hole was the right size and it kind of got stuck in the hole and I was having a hard time getting it out. So I decided to just take this leather hammer and lightly tap it in the hole further to see how it fit in there if I lightly tapped on it. And the CZ completely shattered on me. I was not expecting that. I guess that's why CZ is like $2 for a little thing that big and a diamond, you know, a clear diamond that size would be thousands of dollars. So I'm gonna cut that off and we're gonna practice again. Thankfully we have I don't know, 10 or 15 of those CZs we can practice with. I need to keep practicing setting this stone until I'm very confident I can do it on the real thing. I do not want to break that real black diamond or mess up on the setting and have it come out all crooked or weird in the end of the pommel nut. Once I got the right size hole on the end of the metal, I can take the CZ, put it in the hole, and then take my engraving handpiece and hammer the metal closed around the CZ and hold it in place. I've never done anything like this before, so I am not sure if this is actually gonna work. Wow, the graver remarkably loves to just be right down in that groove between the diamond and the uh, metal. Even though this isn't a real diamond, it still looks really pretty when you turn it in the light. All the reflections coming off of the facets are pretty cool. So first I'm just gonna cut it down to the size that my real pommel nut will be approximately. And then I can shape the end and clean up the end a little bit more. There's actually not gonna be that much metal revealed on the very top, it's mostly gonna be the diamond you see. Okay, I learned something here. If I ever go to set a clear diamond, I need to make sure that I cleaned it off really well before I set it. You can see a fingerprint on this CZ. Well, it's not on the side that you can clean. It's actually on the bottom side up underneath there that you can't get to anymore. Next time I set anything clear, clean it off really well first. No fingerprints. My second test came out really nice. I definitely like it. We're ready to move on to the real thing now. For the real thing, the process is pretty much the same, but the stakes are much higher now. I'm working with a real diamond here and I don't want to mess it up. We've got a nice little place for our black diamond to live with just a little bit sticking up so we can use the engraver to smash it over and hold the diamond in place. At first, I just smash in small points before doing the entire circumference of the metal. I do it in the same manner that you would tighten lug nuts on your car rim. I tighten one, do the one across from it, do one across from that one, and go in an order like that to try to keep the diamond centered. I messed up setting the stone and it was in there kind of crooked, so I had to cut it out with the Dremel tool and make another pommel nut because the other one was getting too short. So we've got a brand new pommel nut here and I'm gonna try setting the stone for a second time. 
This time I'm gonna take it out and check how centered it is and make sure it looks good before I really start hammering it in there. It's still able to be moved around a little bit right now. I think that looks pretty good. It looks very centered. I'm gonna go in and lightly keep working that, uh, closing the metal around the diamond and try to keep a close eye on it. Second time's the charm. The diamond is nice and centered this time and securely held in place. I don't think this is going anywhere anytime soon. Now that the diamond's set, I can take it to the lathe and clean up the metal close to the diamond on the end of the pommel nut. The pommel nut is pretty much finished for now. We'll have to do a little more finishing and then gun blue it later. It has a 1500 grit finish on the top and down in that little groove. Next thing we gotta do is make it so we can do our first official assembly of all these parts. This will be my first official try at fitting the handle, guard, pommel, and pommel nut all together. I think that feels really good, actually. Our guard, handle, pommel, and pommel nut are all fit together nicely. The next thing to work on is shaping it all into an actual handle instead of big giant rectangles. The first component I wanna shape on is the guard. I need to get the top and bottom of it at least roughed in, and then I can base the rest of the handle profile off of that roughed in guard shape. I use a combination of the 2x72 grinders and a really large bit on the milling machine. I just rough the shape in with the mill and the grinder. Once that's done, I can move to files, clean up and fine tune everything. And that's pretty much it for the guard shaping. It's looking very nice. At this point, I'm already over 100 hours into this build. I'm very happy with how the guard shape came out. I love the nice little radius we have right here where the top part of the guard like meets up with the rest of it. It was really hard to shape that with the files, but I got it exactly looking how I wanted it to. The next thing we're gonna work on is the handle. It's time to get this bad boy shaped up. With most of my handles, I start by profiling the handle this way and getting it all flattened this way. But in our case, both of those things are pretty much finished. Since we made the handle out of scales and we put that frame piece in the middle, both the scales are the same thickness, so everything's already profiled side to side. It's good to go there. And we pretty much profiled everything right here, except for this. This needs touched up just a little bit before we move on to shaping the rest of the handles. So that's what I'm gonna start with first. I'm trying to be as safe as I can while working with this carbon fiber. I'm wearing rubber gloves because you can get tons of little splinters just from grinding on the carbon fiber that get between your fingers and they're really annoying and itchy. I'm also wearing a respirator as much as possible and I've got a giant vent fan sucking all the dust away from the grinder. I do a little layout on the end of the handle up against the guard, letting me know where I can grind material and where I need to stop. Carbon fiber is difficult to grind, but not as bad as you might think. There are three things though that make grinding carbon fiber worse than grinding something like stabilized wood or mammoth ivory. One is that the dust is really bad and you definitely don't want to breathe it. Two is that the carbon fiber is pretty hard on your grinding belts. Three is that the carbon fiber grinds away very slowly. I'm done shaping the carbon fiber handle. I love how it came out. It is super cool. I was a little unsure there for a little while because this handle is a shape I've never quite done before. I've done similar ones, but especially this part right here, it's got this really nice flat area with this kind of little rest for your finger right there. And then this area is raised. I've never done a handle shape quite like that. I love how it came out. The relation between the guard and the handle is looking good. We have one more thing that needs to be shaped, and that's our pommel, because right now it's just a big old rectangle. I'm gonna be doing what's called a museum fit, where the handle material is larger and there's this little rounded corner where it meets up with the pommel, and in our case, the guard as well. I like to call that little rounded corner the bull nose, because it reminds me of bull nose corners that my dad and I used to put on the custom homes we built when we did drywall work. 
Instead of the giant one inch corners that dad and I used to do on drywall, the corners on the handle are only gonna be about a 32nd of an inch radius. So much, much smaller, but still kind of the same concept. I'm done shaping the outside of the pommel. I've got a 320 grit finish on it, and it's somewhere between 30 and 40 thousandths of an inch smaller than our handle material. We still need to dome the end of the handle, so that's the next thing I'm gonna work on. To hold my piece, I've just got a block of wood here, and I drilled two holes that are the same distance apart as these pins, and I should be able to just stick it in the piece of wood and take it over to the grinder. Add a little bit of blue Dicom layout fluid, dry it off with a hair dryer, Inscribe some lines. With all the shaping done on the end of the pommel, this knife is really starting to shape up. I love how the handle looks and the relation between the shapes on the handle, the guard, and the blade, how it all works together. I'm working on the gold inlay on the carbon fiber handle. I already did the front part of the handle right here and it came out really, really nice. And this is the first time I've ever inlaid into carbon fiber or any kind of handle material as far as I can remember. The next area I'm gonna work on is this area. We've got these lines that meet up here at a nice little corner and then they swoop down the handle and follow that grind line. I've never done gold inlay on anything like this before. I've pretty much only inlaid gold into metal. I use the dividers to give myself a layout line for the first line of gold. Now that I've got the layout done, I'm gonna start cutting in the groove. For this, I'm gonna use my high-speed dental burr. Normally, you crank this thing up and have it spinning super fast but this diamond coated disc I'm gonna cut with cuts the carbon fiber so aggressively that I actually need to turn this thing down as slow as it'll go basically before the, uh, the thing stalls out. This part is terrifying. I have to muster every bit of focus and concentration that I can in order to cut this groove straight. If I just jerk or have one little muscle spasm, I might make this groove go way off course and completely ruin this gold inlay. I finished cutting the grooves on this side of the handle. The next thing is to dovetail the bottom of the groove. Right now the groove is kind of rounded at the bottom and I actually wanna open up the bottom so that when I smash the gold in, it locks it in place. So here I've got a small carbide burr that I've ground to customize the end of it. And it has four sides and those four sides actually do the cutting. And I'm gonna just go in there at the bottom of the groove and cut a little bit of a dovetail on both sides of the groove all the way down. This part also takes a tremendous amount of concentration. If I slip and make a wrong move with this little point, it'll eat deep into the side of my handle or might make a groove or a spot somewhere that I do not want one. If I don't use enough force and impact on the gold, it won't fill out the dovetails at the bottom and stay in place properly. I've got all my grooves cut in. I've also dovetailed them so our gold will fill out the dovetails when I smash it in and it'll be mechanically locked into place. The gold we're gonna use is 24 karat, 25 thousandths inch thick gold. I'm just gonna smash it in using my engraver handpiece and a brass rod on the end. If I don't use enough force and impact on the gold, it won't fill out the dovetails at the bottom and stay in place properly. I finished smashing all the gold in. It filled out the grooves pretty well. There was a couple places where the grooves were a little bit on the large side, so I hope those look okay once I get everything sanded. Speaking of sanding, I'm gonna start sanding everything flush with some 320 grit and see how this gold inlay looks. This is always my favorite part of doing gold inlay. When you get to sand off the excess gold, get everything cleaned up 
and see how your inlay truly looks. I just finished sanding the handle to 600 grit and that 600 grit actually leaves a nice satiny finish on the gold, which is gonna help it dance around in the light a little bit more. I think it's gonna look really good with the 2K finish over it. At this point, the handle is completely ready for the 2K finish. It's gonna take a number of days to apply many coats on there and let it harden fully and then sand it all and get it looking finished. For the finish I wanna do, we're gonna use Spray Max 2K. The 2K means two component. There's a little container inside of here that you actually break open and mix it in with the rest of it. Once you do that, you have a limited shelf life on this because it'll start to harden even in the can. So you have to use it up within a certain amount of time. Time to release the catalyst. and shake. That's already looking really cool. Oh, this is exciting. It instantly looks really, really cool just with one light coat on. After doing our first three coats, I let the handle dry for 24 hours. We're now ready to scuff up the finish with some 600 grit sandpaper so that the next three coats will adhere to the first three coats better. By the way, I am super happy with how this is looking so far. It immediately added tons of shine to the handle. The chatoyance up here on the edges of the handle looks super, super cool. When you put it in really bright light and move it around, it just dances. I can't wait to see what it looks like when we get all nine coats on here and get it polished out. So why do I even wanna do this 2K finish on the handle? Well, the journey started over a year ago at the Atlanta Blade Show. I took a knife that had a beautiful piece of stabilized wood for the handle, and this piece of stabilized wood was extra special because when I sanded it out and buffed it, it came out so shiny and beautiful. It kind of looked like it was dipped in glass. And ever since then, I've been on a journey for some kind of a finish that would be repeatable that I could use on other materials too. The 2K finish so far has been the closest thing I've found on my journey to kind of repeat that process and be able to get that finish on different types of materials. It seems to be very durable and it can make your pieces look like they're dipped in glass if that's what you're going for. Wow, look at that. This is getting so exciting. I hope this comes out. It's sure looking really good right now. We applied all nine coats of the 2K finish on the handle and let it dry inside for about nine days. It should be completely ready to go for finishing. My plan is to hand sand the handle with 1500 grit to get rid of all the little imperfections in the spray finish, then go over it with 3000 and then begin buffing it to get it polished up real nicely. Ooh, that looks good. Oh, that looks even. Oh, that looks really good. Okay. What I'm sanding out right now are the little imperfections. There's high spots and low spots and some light orange peel. I'm trying to sand all that out lightly with a little bit of 1500 grit so everything's nice, smooth, and flat. Once I'm done sanding, I move over to the buffing wheel. But instead of buffing compound like I normally would use on the wheel, I'm using a 3M car polishing compound. This stuff is designed for polishing finishes like this. And in all my testing, it was by far the best finish I could possibly get. If you use regular buffing compound on this 2K finish, it just smears and does not look good. For the most part, the handle came out looking amazing. It looks like it was dipped in glass, but I had a couple trouble areas that I had to sand on a lot. And because of that, I sanded through the finish right here and right here. Burning through the finish happened from me sanding this area right here. There was some kind of a weird texture that I just thought was on the last couple layers, so I sanded through it, not realizing that I was actually going through pretty much all the layers. So that's why we got a little bare spot there, 
And the same thing happened with this bare spot. I was really focusing on sanding out some weird little bubbly things right here. We only got those weird bubbly things though, right here and right here. I don't know if I sprayed it on on a weird angle or put it on too thick or what, but something I did there caused that weird problem and I had to sand it to get rid of it and burn through. So I'm gonna start back all over again. We're gonna rough up the handle and probably do a full blown nine coats uh, to build it up nice and thick again. Hopefully we won't get those weird little bubbly areas and redo this finish. You don't need to see that though. Hopefully it'll come out looking just like this handle minus the two little places that didn't work out and it'll be all good to go from that point because for the most part, this looks dipped in glass. So while that's drying, I'm gonna work on the engraving on the fittings. We're gonna be doing the X-Cal logo in solid gold. We're also gonna have a couple of these lines that go across the guard and pommel be gold as well. This pattern that we're gonna do on the guard and the pommel kind of represent the feature wall that X-Cal has in their building. It's this really big wall that has these lines across it, kind of going in a similar fashion to what I've drawn here. And then a couple of the lines have lights in them. Instead of lights, I'll have a couple of lines that have 24 karat gold in them instead. I'm gonna start with the pommel, and just like with everything else, I wanna give myself some layout lines to follow. So we're gonna cut in the border of the pommel first. I love engraving. There's something so satisfying about taking a chisel, sharpening it up, and then shoving it through your metal piece and cutting away metal shavings and chips until you've created whatever design you're going for. The grooves are ready for gold inlay. Next, I need to anneal the gold so it's nice and soft to inlay, but I have to be very careful. If I get the gold a little hotter than it needs to be, it'll melt right off. Um, oops. Maybe that handheld torch was a little too much heat. Let's switch over to the lighter and hopefully I can get the gold glowing hot without completely melting it off like before. My gold wire isn't quite the right size for the grooves I've made, so I'm gonna draw the gold through a draw plate and that'll reduce its size just a little bit. The draw plate is a really neat tool. It's got carbide inserts in it of progressively smaller and smaller holes. All you have to do is get the end of the wire through the hole and then you could pull it through with pliers and it essentially stretches the wire out and makes it a tiny bit smaller diameter on the other side of the die. It's such a satisfying feeling to take this soft gold wire and just smash it into a groove and then sand it all smooth and see your gold inlay finished. Now that the gold inlay's done, I need to add a few more grooves that go across kind of in the same type angular pattern that don't have any gold in them. The engraving on the pommel is done. Next, I focus on the guard. The guard, however, will be slightly different. I want to add X-Cal's logo in to one side of the guard and inlay it in gold. I had a custom X-Cal logo stencil made up from IMG. This is the same type of stencil I use to mark my own personal logo. I get the X-Cal stencil centered up on the guard and electrochemically etched through the stencil. I could have laid out X-Cal's logo by hand, but I thought it would be much quicker just to have a stencil made up, electrochemically etch it so I'll have a good mark, and then cut it out and engrave it deeper for the gold. There it is. Looks really good. I've got to make it deeper, dovetail it, put some little teeth at the bottom, and then we'll smash some gold in there. I finished inlaying the 24 karat gold into the X-Cal logo. The next thing I wanna do is outline the border by first marking it with dividers and then cutting it in with the engraver. So I'm gonna spray some dicum so I can see the lines I'm about to create a little easier. From here, I'm just repeating what I already did on the pommel. I add layout lines around the outside border, cut those in with the graver, add the gold into those lines and then cut the rest of the lines in that don't have any gold. Once I'm done with this side of the guard, I repeat the process on the other side of the guard. The only difference being, there's no X-Cal logo on the other side. 
It took a couple days, but I just finished the engraving and I'm super happy with it. I think it really, really resembles the feature wall that XCAL has in their building and I just love it. We've got all the gold lines that represent the lights on the feature wall and then uh, all the lines without gold in them just represent the, the little grooved lines on the feature wall. I think those gold lines are really gonna pop once this is gun blued. They should just be glowing, kind of like the lights are on the actual feature wall. Let's have a little sneak peek. First time I'm seeing this Damascus since the blade was finished. There it is, wow. That gold really pops. I love how you can see the individual bars in the in the tang too, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna go hand sand those oxides off with some 3000 grit and then put it back in for another soak in the ferric chloride. I'll tell you the reason I'm just now finishing the blade. I like to stop on the blade and focus on the rest of the handle when the blade is almost done, but not quite. And the reason being, as I'm working on the rest of the garden handle, I don't wanna have to be extra careful to not scratch the blade or ding it up or anything. Back in the coffee. I mean the acid. Just got done etching the blade. I'm gonna neutralize it before we put it in the coffee to make sure the ferric chloride doesn't eat away at it anymore. We've got water with a whole bunch of baking soda mixed in this pipe. Just took the blade out of the neutralizer after it was in there for a couple of minutes. I'm rinsing that off. We're gonna put it in the coffee solution for four to eight hours and see how it looks after that. To coffee darken the blade, I'm using a high concentration of Nescafe Instant Bold Coffee. This is gonna help the oxides that are already on the blade become even more dark than they are. And it's gonna make the oxides much, much more durable. Into the coffee we go. I let the blade soak in the coffee for about six hours and then I took it out and started rubbing all the yellow oxides off with a sunshine cloth. There was an area all through here though that looked pretty bad. I don't know if there was some kind of oil residue or something in there, but it just didn't accept the coffee darkened finish how I wanted, so I put it back in the coffee for another six or eight hours and then let it set. Now I'm gonna rub the entire blade down once again with sunshine cloth and if it looks really good, we'll move on from there and do a wax finish on it. These sunshine cloths are my secret weapon to get rid of this yellow oxide on here. If the coffee finish is really good, the sunshine cloth won't rub it out on the dark areas where we want it, but it'll get rid of that yellow tint on the 15 and 20. I think I'm done rubbing on the coffee finish with the sunshine cloth. Next thing I wanna do is apply a carnauba wax finish to the blade. This should make the coffee finish even more durable and also make it pop a little bit more as well. I'm gonna heat the blade up with a heat gun. We're only gonna get it like 150 degrees or so, so we don't have to worry about over tempering the blade or anything like that. And then I'm gonna rub this carnauba wax around on the blade, wipe off the excess and see how it looks. The carnauba wax adds to the durability of the finish greatly. And it helps protect the carbon steel the blade's made out of. On top of all that, it makes the dark 1084 look even better. Got a nice heavy layer of the wax applied everywhere. I'm gonna wipe off some of the excess with a paper towel now. The blade is cooled down and the wax is hardened, so now I'm gonna go over it again with the sunshine cloth just to kind of uh, buff up and polish the wax and get it looking real shiny. I just finished polishing and shining up that wax finish and it looks amazing. I'm very impressed with how hard that finish is. The blade is so shiny now too. The carnauba wax is definitely my new favorite. I just, I just love how this blade looks now. It's absolutely fantastic. We've got the bluing salts heating up right now and the chemical cleaners heating up in the ultrasonic cleaner. Let's take the guard over the buffer and buff the finish from 3000 grit hand rubbed to mirror polish like the rest of the pieces. Believe it or not, buffing for me isn't as simple as it sounds. I've tried dozens and dozens of different wheels and compounds to try to find the perfect ones that work for me. Part of the issue for me when I'm buffing pieces, a lot of times, like with these pieces, I'll have gold inlays and I'll have steel. Well, the gold buffs differently than the steel. So one buffing wheel and compound that works great on steel might totally leave the gold all pitted up and look horrible, or vice versa. 
So I have to find the perfect balance between getting the gold to look good and the steel all around it to also look good. Now that the fittings have a beautiful mirror finish, it's time to get them very clean for the gun bluing process. If there's any oil, residue, or compounds left on the fittings, the gun bluing process will be all splotchy and blotchy and it will not look good. While the parts are in the cleaner, I heat up the caustic gun bluing salts to 290 degrees Fahrenheit. I have to be very careful with these salts. Even at room temperature, if you get these salts on your skin, they'll start to burn and itch your skin a little bit. But if you get these salts on your skin when they're 290 degrees, the action is amplified and they burn into your skin much, much quicker. The gun bluing salts break down organic materials like leather and skin very quickly. Oh, okay, that could scratch it. I think it banged into the edge of that pot. Yeah, it did. I mean, without closely inspecting it, the diamond looks nice and shiny and everything still. That's a good sign. That looks amazing. This piece looks like it came out really well. It looks like the diamond was unaffected as well. It's super shiny and pointy still. I think the diamond was okay. It's all really black now. Whoa, look at that gold pop. Oh man, look at that gold. Take a look at that. That looks beautiful. Rinse all that off. Man, that gold really pops. I think it looks good. There were some little specks on there once again, but I think they're just uh, little particles of mineral from the boiling water. I buffed the finish off of our little takedown tool and re-blued it three times now, and it just is not coming out. We're gonna strip this bluing off, and then I'm gonna hand this over to Dad, and he's gonna gold plate it. We've got a gold plating set up inside, and he's used it the most, so he knows how to run it really well. We're gonna put a nice, heavy layer of 24 karat gold plating on there, and see how it looks with that. It's so great having Dad here working with him every day, not just because he knows how to run the gold plating machine, but also because I get to spend time with him. He's on his own knife making journey. He just became a journeyman through the American Bladesmith Society and is already making incredible work. Dad has made so many quality of life improvements to the shop that I can't even begin to list them all. It is fantastic. I really hope Dad can successfully gold plate this takedown tool. I don't know why it wouldn't accept the gun blowing. Hopefully whatever was keeping it from gun blowing properly won't be an issue when it comes to the gold plating. A lot of you guys have been asking me for the links to materials and tools I use. I finally got around to making the ultimate list. I call it the Master Smith Toolkit. It's a free PDF that has links to almost all the tools and materials I use. In the Master Smith Toolkit PDF, you'll find things like where I get my handle materials, where I buy metal for my knives, the exact kind of sandpaper I use for hand sanding, and a lot, lot more. Like I said before, the Master Smith Toolkit is free. When you sign up, I'll email you the PDF. Sign up with the link in the description to get the PDF for free. And here's our finished 24 karat gold plated takedown tool. I think dad did a great job. It looks absolutely fantastic. I couldn't be more pleased with it. Instead of that blued finish, the gold plating looks amazing. There's one more thing we gotta do before we can finally put this knife together and that's get it sharp. At this point, I can barely contain myself. This knife is almost done. I just have to make it through this sharpening without scuffing up the blade, assemble the knife, and it will be finally finished. I've been working on this knife for three months, and I am moments away from finally seeing how all the different components look finished and together. Because so far, we've seen some of the finished components, but we have not seen how they all look together and interact with each other. I finally got it sharpened up. Sometimes they fight you and sometimes they don't. This one definitely fought me. In the process of sharpening it, I think I shaved all the hair off of both of my legs. So it's nice and hair popping sharp now. 
Looks really good. It's ready for final assembly. First piece to go on is the guard. Pop that on there. Then we've got our composite carbon fiber, 24 karat gold, 2K finished handle. Next piece up is the pommel with our lineup pins in it. And then our final piece of the knife is our pommel nut with the black diamond on the end. I'm gonna screw that in most of the way by hand. And then to tighten it down, we can use our 24 karat gold plated hardened steel takedown tool, which is this little bad boy right here. I think snug is right there. Wow, there it is, it's done. The sheath's done, the takedown tool, the little takedown tool sheath, the knife sharpened, bluing, finishes gold. It is done. I have not seen the handle and the fittings together yet with the black fittings and the black carbon fiber handle. They really, really look cool together, like super cool. Let's talk about some of the new things on this knife because it had many things that I've never done before. I've never done this kind of a composite twist pattern Damascus where you have twisted bars that have interrupted twists where it's twisted straight, twisted the other direction. I've also never used the end grain of the carbon fiber on the sides of the handle, so that's a brand new look I've never done before. A big one for me was doing the 24 karat gold in the handle. That was something completely new. I had to do a lot of practice for that in order to get it to work out. I'm very, very happy with it. It came out really cool looking. The 2K finish on the carbon fiber handle was another big new thing for me. The black diamond in the pommel nut. I've never done anything like that. I haven't set a stone in anything except a little practice piece I did a couple years ago. I just stuck a little tiny fake diamond into a penny. I love this X-Cal fighter. I will see you in the next video. May the forge be with you. Bye-bye.